Hey, on behalf of the Free Library of Philadelphia and the Social Science and History Department, let me welcome you to this evening's program. Without further ado, let me introduce you to our host from Pennsylvanians for Modern Course, Lucy Razar. Hello, everyone. My name is Lucy Resar, and I am a program coordinator at Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts. Um, and I have been overseeing the Bail Watch program, which you all are here to learn a little bit more about since August. I'm really, really passionate about the project, and I'm very excited to share it with you all. So thank you so much for joining, and thank you to Maria for hosting us here tonight. Um, so I'll start with a little introduction to Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts. I'll walk through the court system in PA and a little bit about the criminal justice process in Philadelphia. And then I'll talk through what volunteering actually looks like, what observing the courtroom um, looks like, and then I'll open it up to any questions that you all may have. Um, so to start it off, a little bit about Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts. We are a nonpartisan nonprofit that works to bring about a judicial system in which everyone um, is afforded impartiality, fairness, accessibility, and respect. Um, and we have kind of a whole slew of programming that focuses on educating Pennsylvanians about their legal rights, how to navigate the court system, and how to feel empowered um, residents of the Commonwealth in the judicial system. And we engage in a lot of different initiatives, um, including both the volunteer court watching program that I'm about to talk a little bit more about and this educational programming with the free library and with community centers across Pennsylvania. Um, so as I kind of hinted at, we have three main pillars as an organization, PMC Shares, which is what this program is all about, um, going to wise libraries, community centers across the state of Pennsylvania to teach people about the legal system and make sure that we have an educated and empowered Commonwealth. And we have PMC Listens, which is a 1-800 number that people can call into and ask uh, legal questions, ask for resources, and otherwise receive information from the organization. And finally, PMC Watches, which is all about this court watching program that I'll be talking to you all about tonight, um, brings citizens in Philadelphia and in Pittsburgh, we have two programs, um, into the court to be able to watch judges and watch hearings go on, make the court system more transparent, and kind of ultimately bridge the gap between what's happening behind the courthouse doors and how justice is being administered. So a little bit about PMC Watches and the Bail Watch program. So PMC Watches is a community-oriented expansion of what we originally, as an organization, were calling the court watchdog role. Um, so it serves as a way for us to collect data about hearings. Um, it provides an opportunity for community members like you all to gather firsthand info into how justice is being administered and ultimately also works to make sure that the court system is transparent and people know what is happening um, behind those closed doors. And this uh, program launched in April of 2018, which originally focused on preliminary arraignments in Philadelphia's municipal court and has since um, expanded, but I'll talk a little bit about that later. So there are three central goals of the Bail Watch program. The first is to invite the public, students, interested stakeholders, and anyone um, who's looking to understand the court system better into the court system to observe Philadelphia's preliminary arraignment and early bail review hearing processes and learn about the implications of bail policy and pretrial detention. An additional goal is to monitor the current preliminary arraignment and early bail review processes to kind of track the impact of reforms and statutes and new policies as they come about and see if the intended goals of these policies are actually being um, fulfilled in the courtroom and are helping to make the system more just. Um, and then finally, also just to collect and share people's perceptions of both preliminary arraignment and early bail review to ultimately be able to advocate for further improvements and give kind of the courts, um, lawyers and other stakeholders, a really detailed and thorough 
list of what people are seeing, what the perceptions and observations of volunteers are so that we can actually improve this system. And now a little bit about court basics. Um, so as you'll see on this diagram, there's a lot going on in Pennsylvania um, in terms of the different levels of court. As observers, we are observing the bottom tier, uh, which is kind of that red section of the triangle there of the courts of limited jurisdiction. And so across all of Pennsylvania, except in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, are magisterial district courts. Um, and in Philadelphia and in Pittsburgh, which we will be observing, are municipal courts. Um, and so basically, municipal courts are dealing with kind of a lot of these minor level crimes. Um, so they hold the civil, criminal, and traffic divisions. Um, they determine whether a serious case will go to the court of common pleas. They handle all preliminary hearings, so every time an individual is arrested, and here is the case being brought against them, they'll go through a preliminary hearing um, and it'll set bail in all minor cases except those um, that are more extreme that involve murder or voluntary manslaughter. And generally just kind of otherwise they're covering anything um, $12,000 and under, that's a dispute involving monetary claims. Um, and so these minor courts are the first level of Pennsylvania's judiciary um, the courts are presided over by MDJs or magistrates um, and municipal court judges. So the MDJs and magistrates do not have to be lawyers, um, but they are required to pass a qualifying exam. And each court, um, including the minor courts, have their own elected judges at the various levels. So now looking kind of at what the step-by-step -step process looks like for a defendant as they enter the criminal justice system. Um, as observers, we work primarily with the first two steps that are highlighted in red, um, but a defendant could potentially go through all six steps on the board. So it starts, as I mentioned, with a preliminary arraignment, um, which is an individual hearing their case for the first time and kind of then later progresses to some defendants have the chance to get that preliminary bail adjusted, and then maybe later will go into a trial. Um, but what's so critical about these first two steps that are in red are that in Philly and across the country, most cases do not make it to those pre-trial and trial stages. In Philadelphia, only about 7% of criminal cases go to trial. So the vast majority of people are only interacting with the criminal justice system in these early, early steps that are highlighted in red. Um, the vast majority of people are just taking a plea bargain. So most of the defendants are interacting with the criminal legal system only in these early stages. So our work is really, really important because it makes sure that justice is being administered in these early stages um, and is kind of improving the transparency around these foundational steps, which is ultimately where most people in Philadelphia are interacting with the justice system. And so now a little bit more about preliminary arraignment hearings. Um, so like I said, they're the first stage of a criminal case in Philadelphia. Um, and every arrested individual will be given a preliminary hearing. They're also known as bail hearings. You'll kind of hear that thrown around interchangeably and it must happen within 48 hours of an individual's arrest. And here a magistrate will determine whether and under what conditions a person charged with a crime will be released pretrial. So a magistrate has a ton of different options that they can use that I'll go through a little bit more in depth um, shortly. But yeah, this picture is pretty similar to what it looks like here in Philadelphia. Um, and at this preliminary hearing, um, a judge is supposed to be considering a ton of factors about a defendant's um, circumstances and the circumstances of the crime. However, as you'll see if you volunteer with us, um, preliminary arraignment hearings usually only last for one to two minutes. So a judge isn't really audibly going through all these factors um, and isn't really explaining where his decision about a bail is coming from, his or her decision. Um, but the law says that a judge is supposed to be considering all of these. So first, the nature of an offense. Um, so anything kind of involving the crime itself. 
um, the defendant's employment status and history and their financial conditions. So whether they have a job that they're expected to be at um, and kind of if they're even able to pay a bail at all. Um, the nature of the defendant's family relationships. So if they have family members that they're responsible for taking care of. Um, the length and nature of a defendant's residence. So whether they have been a long lifetime resident of Philadelphia or if they're just passing through and might be considered more of a flight risk for that reason. Also, substance abuse issues are taken into consideration. And then another factor that comes up a lot is whether an individual um, previously was released on bail and whether that individual appeared as required and complied with the conditions of bail or for whatever reason did not show up at court. Um, and then similarly, whether the defendant has a record or history of flight or avoiding arrest or escaping um, prosecution or attempted escape at all. Um, the prior criminal record is also something a judge will take into consideration, any use of false identification, and then kind of this last really, really broad category of any other relevant factors that the judge might deem relevant. But like I said, these preliminary hearings are happening really, really quickly. Um, so you're not always seeing a judge really go into depth in all of these factors. And a little bit more about how the hearings are actually conducted. Um, so a defendant is not in the room. They are brought in um, via CCTV. So they're videoed in, um, which as we all have kind of come to learn throughout COVID, being in a room physically is quite different than being videoed in. So you'll often encounter audio troubles, um, issues with defendants not being able to hear what's going on in the courtroom, which obviously holds really grave implications since this courtroom is deciding um, such an important decision for the defendant's life. Um, and with preliminary arraignment, a defendant might not have spoken to an attorney prior to the hearing and is not given a chance to speak with the attorney during the hearing. So they're often going in quite blind and there's no possibility for any private um, interaction during the hearing. And so a defendant has, however, spoken to pretrial services, again, through video. Um, so the magistrate has access to some information regarding the defendant and the crime and the allegations but it's very, very limited and there's not a ton of detail that um, the magistrate usually has. And so now, as I mentioned, I'll walk you through the options that um, a judge has to determine an individual's bail. So an, a judge can release on recognizance, which means that a defendant is released from jail without paying money. It means they just sign a document that states that they'll appear for their future court date. And then there is release on unsecured bail bond, or what you'll often hear is SOB or sign on bond, um, which means that a monetary bail is set and the judge or magistrate will say that monetary amount, but no money has to be posted for that amount. So the defendant doesn't actually have to pay at that moment um, to be released from jail. It's just if that defendant later fails to appear at the future court date that they will be um, held reliable for that money. And then you can obviously detain a defendant until trial. So that would mean that the judge is not setting any monetary amount or any conditions. The defendant just has to remain behind bars until the next court date. Um, and then the judge or magistrate also has the opportunity to set non-monetary conditions. So this could be house arrest, electronic monitoring, um, check-ins with pretrial services, stay away orders, anything kind of along those lines that the judge or magistrate has the power to do, but it's not a monetary amount. And then finally, um, what we see a lot is release on monetary condition, also known as cash bail, um, which is the judge sets a level of money that is supposed to be reasonable and is supposed to take into consideration the defendant's ability to pay. And um, according to the law, it's really only supposed to be used in exceptional circumstances. Um, as you see, that's not always the case. These monetary conditions don't always seem reasonable at all um, and are used quite frequently, but they are supposed to be reasonable and are supposed to be only exceptional. 
and a little bit more about cash bail. Um, so cash bail is legally only supposed to be a monetary condition for pretrial release, and it's only supposed to serve as an incentive to return to court. Um, it's not supposed to be used um, as a punishment for the individual being arrested, and it's definitely not supposed to be used as an attempt to keep the defendant out of the community for safety, uh, for safety reasons. That would be what exists in the court system for that is denying bail altogether and detaining an individual until trial. However, interestingly, as you kind of observe these hearings more and more frequently, you see that the defense attorney and the judge or magistrate often brings up concerns for public safety and brings up these, um, you know, references to public safety in terms of bail and in terms of the amount of money they're being set. But in reality, that's not really what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, a judge or magistrate is absolutely supposed to consider the financial ability of the defendant to actually pay that amount and is supposed to consider um, whether that amount seems reasonable to the average person. Um, but kind of just as a counter to what this system looks like, there are jurisdictions that have abolish cash bail um, with very, very few exceptions and have kind of envisioned a hearing and preliminary arraignment system that doesn't rely on monetary amounts at all. So right near us, New Jersey has done this, um, Washington DC has done this, and recently Illinois has also done this. Um, and a few other jurisdictions across the country have done similar things. So I bring that up just to say that while Philly is, um, currently using cash bail and is frequently, frequently assigning defendants a monetary amount that they need to pay. That's not the only way. Um, and we've seen successful examples of justice systems relying on alternatives. And now a little bit about what we are observing this year. Um, so since August, we have started observing early bail review hearings, um, which are a new program that were initiated in 2021 um, with funds from a MacArthur grant, actually, which is interesting. Um, and so this is available to um, some defendants, not all defendants, basically defendants who have a monetary bail set below $250,000. They have the chance to go before a judge and have the magistrate's preliminary bail adjusted. So um, this happens within three to five days after that preliminary arraignment occurred and after that preliminary bail was set. Um, so they have the, at this point in this, in the process, they have the opportunity to meet with their attorney and obtain evidence that might help their case and might um, push the judge to adjust the preliminary bail. Um, and here, the judge's role is to look over the evidence submitted by both the defense attorney and the bail has, that has been set earlier and listen to what um, the DA representative has to say. Um, and the judge here has the option to take in all the evidence that's being presented, um, speak with the defendant, and then ultimately reduce, keep, or even um, increase the amount of bail that was previously set. So I've seen an increase a few times. It's quite rare um, in my personal experience, but it does happen. Um, and then also the judge, in addition to adjusting that bail, can also kind of add in new things so they can make recommendations that the defendant attends mental health services or otherwise does kind of pretrial services in addition to whatever that monetary bail is or non-monetary conditions for release. And now kind of a side by side of what these two first steps look a little bit different, um, which is interesting to see, like I said, um, preliminary arraignment is a magistrate, so not necessarily a lawyer, while early bail review is, um, a, is overseen by a judge, which a judge is always a lawyer here in Philadelphia. And um, like I said, preliminary arraignment hearings happen really, really quick. A judge goes, or excuse me, a magistrate goes through them very quickly, 
Whereas in early bail review, you'll see a judge take more time on the cases, um, sometimes engage family members that are in the room, um, maybe speak directly with the defendant and ultimately just kind of spend more time on each case. Um, and so, like I said earlier, preliminary arraignment, you're operating on very little information usually. Um, there's sometimes gaps in police reports. The DA and the PD don't always have all the information on hand. Whereas early bail review, you're supposed to have a little bit more information to go off of. Um, and the judge usually has sufficient evidence to adjust the bail or keep the same if that's what they deem relevant here. Um, and as I mentioned, the defense in early bail review does have the opportunity to speak with the defendant and the defendant's family, whereas that does not always happen um, and usually does not happen with preliminary arraignment. And now kind of just a little graphic of what the courtroom actually looks like. Um, and if you volunteer us with us, you'll get very familiar with this image. Um, so the when you walk in, there is a gallery in the back um, where I sit and where all the volunteers sit. Um, and you'll also see family members sitting there, sometimes students, law students that are observing. Um, and then you'll see the public defender on the right side of the courtroom. And if a defendant has hired a private attorney, they will step up to that bench um, when the defendant appears on the screen. Um, and on the left side is the representative from the district attorney's office. And then you have the defendant on the TV screen above them. As I mentioned, there's um, kind of the video element of this leaves a lot to be desired for in the courtroom. There's often, you know, volume issues, connectivity issues, um, and not always the best level of communication is able to occur. And then obviously the judge is front and center in, in the blue stand there. And that's kind of what the courtroom looks like. And now where this actually occurs in Philadelphia, um, so it takes place at the Juanita Kidd Stout Center for Criminal Justice, right by City Hall, um, 1301 Filbert Street, and early bail review occurs Monday through Friday, every day of the week, um, other than the weekends, at 9 a.m., and usually runs 9 to 11-ish, depending on the judge. As you go more frequently, you kind of realize that judges... Um, really have a lot of different personalities going on. So some will kind of go more quickly through the cases and not engage as much with family members and the defendant, whereas others um, will take a lot more time with the cases and really converse with people in the courtroom and the defendant on the screen. So it varies from judge to judge. Um, and what to actually do when you arrive. Um, so this is all kind of logistics about what volunteering actually looks like. Um, and if you do choose to volunteer the first time you go, you'll be accompanied by me or another member of Pennsylvania's for Modern Court staff. So you don't have to memorize all of this, um, but just to give you an idea of what it looks like, um, you walk in, you go through a metal detector and you have your bag searched. Um, then you go to the fourth floor, which is where early bail review takes place. And it's in one of three rooms, 403, 404, or 405, usually not labeled, which sometimes makes it a little bit difficult to find, but there is a courthouse site that you can use, um, or you can respectfully look into the rooms um, and see where it's happening. And it's always going to be in one of those three rooms, which is helpful to know. And um, usually observers are asked why they're there. Sometimes the judge speaks with them. Um, and my volunteers and myself always just explain that we're observing with Pennsylvanians for modern courts. And they usually are familiar with the program um, and understand that you're just there to observe and learn. And now what's I think is the most exciting part of actually volunteering and this project more broadly is what actually happens with your responses and your observations. So in a moment, I'll walk you through um, the forms you submit as a volunteer and what we're actually kind of taking down pen and paper of what is happening with each hearing. But I wanted to give you an idea of what actually happens with those responses before I show you the forms themselves. So we 
create um, bail watch reports with all of this data. Um, and so our first one was released in 2018 um, and was um, focused primarily and exclusively, excuse me, on um, preliminary arraignment. So it took into account all of the observations from volunteers um, observing preliminary arraignment and was ultimately released to criminal justice partners, judges, lawyers, people from the DA's office and the public defender's office, and all of the volunteer data, observations, and impressions served as the basis for this report. And across the board, the overwhelming consensus among volunteers was that Philadelphia's preliminary arraignment system undermined the rights and dignities of people charged with crimes, so this report is available on our website and there um, were a slew of kind of trends in the data, um, but overwhelmingly people found that the video conference element really hindered the ability for defendants to actively engage with their hearing and be present in the courtroom and hear what was going on. Um, and also defendants found that the fact that or excuse me, observers found the fact that defendants didn't have the chance to speak with counsel before preliminary arraignment to be um, what they seemed to see as a challenge for the defendant. Um, and so these were kind of among many others, overwhelming trends that were found. And so with these observations, we compiled a list of recommendations for what we thought would be important for the court system to amend and make the preliminary arraignment and ultimately Philadelphia's bail system more broadly, more just. Um, and in 2023, just recently in October, we released an additional report. Um, so it kind of built on the work that was done in 2018. And after 2018, several changes have been brought about in the courthouse um, and was actually kind of served as the basis in a Supreme Court case in Pennsylvania that was used um, from the first judicial district of Pennsylvania. So they were taken to the state Supreme Court and several changes were made to preliminary arraignment, um, particularly involving what must be included in the official court record and what must be stated out loud for the defendants. And a lot of those observations that we made in this report were used in that case. So things have changed since 2018, but there remains a lot of work to be done. And so the 2023 report built on this um, and offered additional recommendations and observations um, from different volunteers and returning volunteers. And so now as we continue in this data collection and analysis, we are focusing on early bail review, um, which I think is really exciting because as I mentioned, it's a new program so there's not a ton of data on it. There's not a ton of analysis and writing that exists on early bail review. So you all volunteering and sharing observations and helping this data collection is really, really important um, because early bail review came about from um, an attempt to reduce pretrial detention um, and make the system more just and fair it's important to see if that's actually happening, if people are being released more frequently with early bail review or not. Um, and your data and analysis and observations is super, super critical to determining that. Um, and now a little bit back to just rules and guidelines, um, less exciting than the reports, but still important. Um, so the first time you go, I will give you a pin that you get to wear. It just helps to identify you, show that you're not an attorney or a family member. Um, and I will bring uh, printed observations forms with you the first time. And then after that, as you go independently, you'll bring those forms um, just by yourself. Um, I recommend volunteers arriving 15 minutes before nine, just because um, sometimes it takes some time to get through security and a judge might start right at nine. So you never want to interrupt them um, if you can avoid that. And the reason we have printed observation forms is because the courthouse does not allow any phone or electronics computers to be used or making any noise in the courtroom. So they have to be powered off um, and on silent mode. 
And so you can't take pictures or record anything. Um, and a judge will make you leave if you bring out any technology or if it makes a noise. Um, and of course, the success of this program requires that we have a working relationship with the courts and the court administrators. Um, and they're always really great and happy to see volunteers as long as everyone is being respectful and um, abiding by these rules, especially because you never wanna detract from a defendant's case um, and distract everyone. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the data that you all provide is super, super critical to bringing about positive change in the judicial system and making sure that our judges and justice system more broadly is held accountable. So after observing, um, making sure to submit your observation forms is really critical. And um, again, this is a little bit more logistics. Um, so once you um, start volunteering with us, um, you can do that through a weekly email that I send out. So I can add all of your emails to the listserv that I have. And I send out a calendar that you can sign up to go on your own after you've gone accompanied. Um, and it really depends kind of how often you're going on your schedule. We recognize that people are busy. Um, so just going as frequently as you can is amazing. Um, and then as just, uh, you know, a mention, we say that it's best to dress appropriately, be respectful of everyone in the courthouse and follow all those rules. Um, because as a volunteer, you are representing Pennsylvanians for modern courts and, um, really just want to help to make sure that the justice system is moving smoothly and justice is being administered, which happens best when everyone is respectful of the courthouse. Okay, so now that we've gone through logistics, I'm gonna show you all what the forms actually look like. Um, so I'm gonna switch my screen sharing for you all. Um, so this is the sheet you will get. It's This will be the paper form. Um, and I have replicated all of the details I told you all and that were on the PowerPoint. So you don't have to memorize all of that. You get all that information. And we also have a kind of helpful glossary of terms that are thrown around in the courtroom um, because the judges, the DA, the PD, they talk really quickly um, and you might miss something. You might also just not know something. I don't know a lot that happens and gets said. So this glossary is very helpful. And then this is what the sheet looks like for each defendant. Um, each defendant gets their own sheet. So you record the date and time, whether the individual was represented by the public defender or if they had private counsel um, and the judge's name. And then you'll write down as many charges and allegations as you can get. Sometimes there's multiple charges, possibly multiple cases going on um, that can get a little bit confusing. So just writing down as much as you can gather is super helpful. Um, prior convictions, um, the judge usually says those and any FTAs, which is a failure to appear. So if a defendant was previously convicted or previously arrested and was asked to show up for a court and they did not, um, that would be an FTA. Um, and then recording the current bail, what the preliminary arraignment bail was set at, what the defense is requesting and what the DA's office is requesting. And then ultimately, what the judge in this case determines the new bail to be. If it remains the same, you write remain the same. And then we have a little bit of demographic questions. Um, this is based on your personal perception. So if you feel that you can identify um, the defendant on the screen, then you can do that. If you don't think you can or don't feel comfortable answering those questions, that's fine. Um, this question is obviously just important because we know that um, the race of a defendant, in fact, affects their um, the way they interact with the court system. And our 2018 and 2023 report have both found that um, people of color are overwhelmingly um, represented in the courtroom and in early bail review and preliminary arraignment at much higher rates um, than individuals that are not of color. Um, and then, Beyond demographics, we ask a little bit about if the judge is explaining why people are in court, um, because 
you know, there's often kind of a miscommunication going on between the individual on the screen and the judge. So if they're explaining why they're in court and what the early bail review hearing is going to look like, that's very helpful for the defendant. Um, if the judge asks any questions about the previous hearing, if the public defender provides the defendant's criminal history. Um, and then this is kind of your personal perception of how strongly a failure to appear affected the judge's consideration. If it affected it quite strongly, a judge usually says that and usually says, you know, with this many FTAs, I just can't adjust the bail. Or, you know, usually you'll get a strong hint of what the judge is thinking about in early bail review because more time is spent on the cases and they usually explain their thinking. Um, and then whether or not the judge stated the defendant's next court date, this is really, really important um, because you know, data has shown that the reason people don't show up for their court date is usually because of logistics. They don't know where to go. Uh, they don't know the date or the time. They have transportation issues. So if the judge isn't saying the next court date, that kind of has implications um, for whether the defendant is actually even able to show up. Um, and then again, how much time is spent on the case? Um, this obviously is just interesting to see if a judge is really taking a lot of time with the cases, you know they might be considering those factors in a little bit more depth than a judge who is breathing through the cases. Um, and then there is space for miscellaneous, miscellaneous comments by the judges or additional comments about if there were family members present, um, if the public defender or DA made you know something that stood out to you. Um, a lot of the people in the courtroom have big personalities and make a lot of comments about the cases or the circumstances. So this can kind of be a fruitful section to remark any of that. And then you'll go through this for every defendant that you observe. Sorry, just gonna scroll down to the end. And then this last section is really, really important and really helpful um, for the reports that we create. It's kind of a concluding reflection on your whole experience in court. Um, so you reflect on whether the judge, the DA, um, and the defense attorney explained the early bail reprocess. Um, if you felt that everyone in the courtroom was professional and prepared, why or why not? Um, if the judge you thought showed any admirable patterns or kind of on the flip side, if you thought that the judge showed any biases or prejudice um, toward the defendants or anyone else in the courtroom. And then kind of what you think about the judge, what did the judge consider? Um, and like I said, the judge usually kind of explains their thinking. Um, and then what do you think the PD or the DA had more influence in the judge bails, the judge's bail hearing ruling? Um, so what you think kind of was most important in swaying the judge one way or the other. Um, and then if any other case, any particular case stood out to you, um, approximately how many observers were in the courtroom. This is interesting because I've been in um, courtrooms where I've heard the judge explicitly say to me, wow, like it's um, it's one of the most frightening things as a judge to be standing before a courtroom full of observers. So it's interesting for us to see if actually the amount of people in the room influence and might have kind of a correlating um, factor with what the outcome actually is. And then finally, um, if you have any questions or concerns about how hearings are conducted or about the process, you can leave those there. And that's a space for me to see those questions and I can write back with any answers. And um, quickly, I will show, I'll go back to this observation, or excuse me, my PowerPoint. So the online submission form looks very, very similar. Um, it's just an online format of that paper doc that you all will then transfer whatever you wrote on the paper to the online form um, for the reasons of technology not being allowed in the courtroom. The only caveat about the online submission form is if you observe more than nine defendants in a day, which usually if you go for the whole EBR hearing, a judge will go through more than nine. You'll just have to resubmit. You'll have to start a new form because of space constraints, but otherwise identical to the paper forms. And a little bit about if you are a volunteer that has special accommodations. Um, 
There is a request form on the courthouse website. Um, and we also recommend that you call the court um, a few days or so in advance to give them notice of those accommodations. Um, and this number can be sent out to everyone. So no worries about um, copying that down now. And then just generally some quick resources. Um, if you are volunteering with us, you can shoot me an email or with any questions, concerns, issues you're having, um, my email is lresar at pmconline.org. Um, and I can also have Maria send that out. So again, you don't have to copy that down. Um, and if you have broad questions about PMC's work outside of Bail Watch, you can email our staff email. Um, and I also have my phone number up there for any time sensitive questions if you're at the courthouse and you know need a quick response. Um, my phone number is the best way to reach me. And like I said earlier, um, for volunteers, I send out a weekly email with program updates, the schedule for the upcoming week um, for you to sign up to volunteer, all the forms you need, all the links you need, um, and then answers to any questions that volunteers included in their observation forms or otherwise emailed me and asked. So I try to make it as easy as possible for volunteers in those weekly emails. And that is the end of the presentation. Um, if anyone has any questions, they are more, oh wow, there are a lot of questions in the chat. Okay, amazing, I'll get to those. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing. Yes, I can send out those slides. Maria will send them out to um, the list or I will, depending on how we coordinate that tomorrow, but you all will definitely get those. Um, and regarding how many cases are heard in the course of a day, it really depends on the judge um, and the particular docket that a judge is handed that day. Um, so if a judge has a lot of cases and is an individual who goes quite quickly, you can hear a ton in a day. I think I've heard upwards of like 15 to 20 um, from nine to 11. Um, but if you have a judge that, you know, spends a lot more time on each case and might have just in general, fewer people on the docket, you can hear 10 to 12, but that's usually what you're looking at. Um, the time commitment for this is really up to you. If you are someone who can volunteer every week, that's amazing. If you're someone who can volunteer once a month, every two months, every three months, that's also fine. Really work with your schedule um, and whatever time you have, we really, really appreciate. And can you accept pictures of the completed form? We prefer that you type it up, um, but if there is an issue and you aren't really well versed in typing it up or otherwise uh, just need a hand, you can absolutely send me them, you can email them to me or text me them, whatever you prefer. But yes, I can absolutely accept pictures if you cannot type them up. And I think that's all the questions in the chat. Um, I'm happy to answer any more if anyone has, and I'm always available on email or, um, on my phone. You can text me or email me. And I really, really appreciate you all joining. Um, this volunteer project is very near and dear to my heart. So I'm very excited to have you all, um, here and listening. And thank you so much to Maria again for hosting us tonight. Thank you, Lucy. And everyone, enjoy your evening.